What's up guys, welcome to episode 2 of From Losing to Cruising. My student Mark, the subject of this series, just had to deal with a huge amount of criticism from me. It was mostly constructive, I was a bit harsh at times, but I'm not going to lie, this episode is going to be difficult for Mark to take, but he's going to grow from it. He's made some plays, as you'll see, in this session that he's really not proud of, that illustrate a very common leak in his game, and I think a leak that will be relatable for many of you out there. I didn't quite realise this before recording this episode, but my student is a station. But don't worry, we start fixing it today, we're going to fix it in the weeks to come. Let's get Mark from losing to cruising. What is up guys, welcome to the second ever episode of From Losing to Cruising. Mark, are you cruising yet or are you still losing? I'm definitely not cruising. No? Are you going like, kind of juddering along or are you sinking to the bottom of the ocean um, or what's happened since lesson one i had some big hands this week and they didn't most of them didn't go my way so i think my line is probably like that so i'm interested to get into into them because a lot of them are river spots which is what we said we talked about this week so i mean when the big hands don't go your way you're never going to win the best players in the world are going to lose in sessions where the big hands don't go their way and it's almost better in a sense because sometimes a student will have the first session they'll feel a bit clearer about their game. Then they'll coincidentally run like God and they'll be like, I'm crushing it. Thank you so much. Look at this turnaround in my game. When really all that's happened is that they ran well and they probably haven't even like applied anything yet. So it's okay. It's cool to lose after the first session. It's going to go like that sometimes. Poker is a long journey. We are in this for the long haul. So we're going to look at mayhem on the river today. We're going to look at these big pots where you got put in some tough river situations. And we're going to see which ones are okay and where we can maybe tighten things up. Guys, watching a Carrot Poker School training video is like getting an elite academic education in cash game poker that you simply cannot get anywhere else. If studying poker was like studying, say, law for instance, then choosing the Carrot Poker School would be like getting into the top law school in the country. Imagine getting 33 lectures from such an establishment for less than a thousand pounds. Most poker players struggle because they simply lack the theory necessary to understand the mechanics of this complex game properly. They get disorganized, random content, and rely on the advice of peers in study groups and forums who are also struggling. The Carrot Poker School gives you all of the material you need to achieve your wildest poker dreams. The rest is up to you. To pick up the Carrot Poker School today, click the top link in the description, head on over to carrotcorner.com, Add it to your cart, go to checkout, make a payment, and you are done within 10 seconds. You can then download all of our videos and get ready to start your full scholarship. Let's get back to the action. So first time we have ace nine of spades. We open under the gun. We get a call from the big blind. We have king queen three. As always, I'll kind of go over to you and just get a quick take from you on like how you're approaching the spot. I think this is good board for my range. I'm range betting here. Okay, so we, we have two options here. We can either range bet and we can bet small or we can bet big and then we probably can't range bet because one thing you can't really do here with a hand like jack of diamonds jack of hearts is make a big bet so let's try and clear that up either we're going to range bet small on really favorable textures or we're going to build a bigger bet on king queen three two tone you can do either you can range bet small or you can build a bigger bet size and be a bit more polarized you can still have a high-ish betting frequency overall but yeah. the big range bet is something that's really only possible in three bet pots for the most part, where you have a massive range and nut advantage. Here you do have a big range advantage, but that's not enough to justify betting big with your range because your range is a little too mergy for that in certain places, jacks, yeah. tens, etc. Be yeah, aware okay. of that distinction. So let's say in future we'll build some kind of polarization or we'll just bet our range. Bill and raises, your thoughts? I think so they're polarizing and I think I can, obviously I can call. I think it's a must call, it's a big sizing. So I'm not inclined to re-raise here. I'm just inclined to call. Okay. Are there any hands you would three bet the flop with? I think if I had kings and queens, maybe I would. So what is urgency like here? How high do you think urgency is in a spot where you've been raised big, you're in position, you're only on the flop? How no. urgent is it? It's low. So what could be a simplification here? Because you make your life very hard, Mark. I have to say you make your life incredibly difficult when it doesn't need to be sometimes, right? We've seen this with some of your flop strategies. They can be simpler. They can be easy. You can let yourself off the hook a little bit. And we see this here as well. So what do you think would be like the simplification strategically 
for your range that I'm driving at here. Just call with everything you're continuing, right? Don't build a three bet range in position against the very polar action on the flop. Clear that up, get rid of the muddledness of your thought process there, and it will really help free up space for other operations in your brain. Yeah. Okay, so we call. Villain then pots the turn. Your analysis here, please. I think similar, just call. I'm not building a raising range, and I have the nut flush draw, so. I think that's pretty fair. Similar thing as before, villain is very polarized. I mean, sometimes when you get to really low SPRs, you do end up like jamming the rest in with certain hands. I wouldn't be doing that here. I would just be playing call only at this SPR, the stack to pot ratio. So call again seems good. How could you bring in something from grade one of the Carrot Poker School at this point? If you had a student here, if you were the coach and I was your student and I was saying, I don't have the odds to call. I need X percent equity. I don't have X percent equity. I'm going to fold. What would you say to me? Uh, that doesn't take into account the implied odds. We have the not flush. So we have implied odds when we hit our flush. And and we're ahead of the um, the draws as well. So right. Draw. That's a really key point, right? Because if Villain actually checks the river here, I'd recommend that you check back. Mm. And the reason for that is that Villain is now so polar that turning your hand into a bluff wouldn't really make a lot of sense because you're beating the give-ups anyway, you're beating the nine high flush draw, the jack high flush draw, the jack 10, the ace, not the ace jack, but the jack nine. So you're beating so many of those hands anyway. And you do actually have pretty close to a bluff catcher here. Okay, maybe sometimes Velen has a case 10 or ace jack or something and they're bluffing, but you beat a lot of hands here that are bluffing. So definitely a call, we hit the nut flush on the river. Velen goes all in. What are your thoughts here? I find it hard to get away here. Okay, the question for me is, can he be doing this with lower flushes? And I think he can. I don't know. I don't know is the answer. It okay, so you don't know this fair. human. You don't know this person. You don't know this human being. So it would be a very unreasonable task if I asked you to tell me whether this human being and his brain had decided to use worse flushes or not for value. That's an unanswerable question, isn't it? Yeah. So how could I ask a better question to you here? If you don't know this person, how could They're I ask in a population? population. What are, exactly. What are population doing here? Yeah. If you survey like a thousand people, how many of them will sometimes have worse flushes for value here? I think some will. Uh, at this SPR of one, I think some will, yeah. There yeah, will absolutely. Be. So basically in Carrot Poker School speak, we have a value beater. And if we did have a bluff catcher, it's a pretty good bluff catcher as well. We block the nut flush, but it's better than that, obviously. It's a value beater. It's beating things like Jack 10 of spades, which I think are going to now jam. Having reached this node with a flush as villain, how do you not jam a flush, you know? Like, what else are you going to do? Like, check fold the river having made your flush? Like, check call against the more condensed range than your own? No, I think that while there are some boats here, and we're going to lose sometimes, this is an incredibly standard and easy call, and I think you've played this hand absolutely fine. How did this hand leave you feeling? Did you have any doubts about this, or were you okay with it? I did, but it's, it's only, and it's probably remembering the losses more so when a board pairs and i have a flush like i have a bad memories in my brain of looking back at these hands and thinking they always have it but i think that's probably biased uh, cognitive bias more than than reality yeah no, it, felt shit. It, it felt really really shit yeah yeah i mean whenever you lose a pot like this i would say that it's very plausible that you were losing the majority of the time but that's okay if you're losing 65% of the time here, you're making a very winning call. You're getting better than two to one. You have to ask yourself, well, how often did I want to win? Was I wanting to win 40 or 50% of the time to make calling okay? Some students want to win two thirds of the time to call like subconsciously. That's their benchmark in their, in their brain, you know? You need to check in with your subconscious there and say, listen, mate, listen, mate, how often were you wanting to win, mate? That's what you have to say to it. You have to interrogate it in that yeah. accent next time you're in this spot. I spent some time in Newcastle and all I heard was those accents for a while, so they're born into my brain now. 4-7. How do you possibly get into a big pot with 4-7? Oh, stop. This is, this is, this is bad, yeah. No, it happens. You're meant to be in big pots with 4-7 sometimes, sorry. Yeah, I called and I don't know, is that, is that a complete... It's probably not. Um, it's, it's okay. I mean, it's, it's whatever. It's probably very close to break even, so I wouldn't worry too much about it. You can call, you can not call. The low cards are really live in these preflop situations against early position. They're some of the hands that convert equity to EV the smoothest. They don't have that much equity, but they convert what they do have to EV in an okay way. Like if you have like ace six off here, it's a much worse hand than four seven suited in this context. Okay, we flop a flush and villain bets big. Your thoughts? I'm not building a raising range on this flop, this texture. I don't think so. I'm Why just not? Calling. 
because I think it's very polarized. The, the texture is very polarizing. He's bet bigger than mm -hmm. I would have expected on this flop. So I think he's relatively polarized. Like I, I'd normally expect a small bet. Mm -hmm. What do you think it says about the player profile that you could be up against here? We don't know for sure, but how does it swing the likelihood of who your opponent is here? It's probably a weaker player. Mm -hmm. Using that sizing because he shouldn't use that sizing, I don't think, on this. Okay. Oh. Let's stay with that train of thought. If it's probably a weaker player, it may be a reg that just is doing this for some reason, but if it's a weaker mm. player or even a weaker regular, what could be different about their range than what GTO would do if it built the sizing? I would expect it to be more merged. Good. So actually, exploitatively, if you want, what you shouldn't do here is be like, oh, if Pio was to bet really big here, it would have a super polar range and blah, blah, blah. Like, I think in reality, the, the humans who actually bet big here are weaker players by and large. No offense to you, audience, if you bet big here. I'm like, not trying to attack you or anything. But yeah, this is a very polarizing flop for the big blind and therefore the sizing that Hijack wants to use here is typically a small bet. So I think the range could be a lot mergier than you would think. What could you maybe adjust then in your thought process there if this is actually a weaker player with a mergier range than you might expect? I guess then raising raising could have could have merit. Yeah. Against that range, yeah. Or at least building a raising range could have merit, right? You want to be clear yeah. about whether we're discussing your hand yeah. or your range, and we want to always state that, right? Be explicit about that, I think. Yeah. So I think you could probably raise this hand because I think it's a weaker player who will be betting far too big and far too often with hands like top pair, over pairs, mm. etc. Mm. Flush draws. I think you're just going to see a very linear-esque range here. You'll see some pure bluffs like King, Queen of Hearts, but I think those will be underrepresented in the true strategy here. And I think hands like Ace, Queen with the Queen of Diamonds, Pocket Tens with a Diamond, King, Jack of Clubs will be overrepresented in the true strategy here, if that makes sense. So raising is going to be good, but I think call is okay. We call villain bets over bets another strange thing i mean monotone flop over bet turn again not a thing a solver's going to do but then again over bet is such a reggae thing to do that I'm, I'm now beginning to think this is like some kind of like weaker regular rather than a fish but who knows yeah what, you, what are your thoughts at this point with with your seven high flush when i checked my my plan was to check raise on on this type of a card so and then when he over bet that went out the window i just went to call more i think he's polarized and I didn't feel like I, I should have a raising range against that range. Yeah, so I think one thing I would start off by saying here is that if you face like a more normal sizing, again, in GTO terms, your hand is like a bad flush. It's not clear to me that it's a great check raise at that point, because if you want to say that on the flop that your opponent's range is theoretically very polarized and you're not doing any raising, then they bet big again on the turn it actually further polarizes their range, right? So it might not be that. It's a little bit inconsistent, is what I would say. Yeah. You could build raises on the turn with like king high flushes, ace high flushes here. I think a seven high flush against the normal sizing is just the call. I don't think this is a hand that at this point gains enough by raising here. However, I'll stress this again. If we do think that villain is a weaker player with way too merged of a range, then we can definitely check raise the turn. It really comes down to how polarized your opponent is. I think one thing you need to work on is switching modes, right? When am I thinking theoretically and when am I thinking exploitatively? And can I be explicit about when I'm switching from one mode to another? And can I do both on the flop there? Can I do both on the turn there? Try to get into that habit. So hopefully that makes sense. Recall, yeah. which is definitely the right play now. I would never raise the sizing with this hand. This is now a... Theoretically, it might be getting close to being a bluff catcher. Against the reality here, who knows? It may, it may be beating more value bets than that. Nine of clubs in the river. We check. Villain goes all in. Grim spot, right? Let's hear your analysis. I, fi I just find it very hard. I know, in, I think in GTO, this is a call. I don't think it's ever a fold, but I think this spot is under bluffed. It's a triple barrel spot on a monotone flop. It seems under bluffed, in which case I have a bluff catcher and it's a pit. But in game, I, I couldn't see that. I, I couldn't. I give them credit for having ace, a diamonds, X, and that's that's how I justify a call here. And okay. So we have two kind of conflicting thoughts. On the one hand, you seem to be saying that this is an under bluffed spot. If our hand is a bluff catcher, RE grade one lecture five of the Carrot Poker School, then we know that if this spot is significantly, I'll be a bit more accurate here, right, mm. significantly under bluffed, then all bluff catchers will be a fold. If the spot is close to balanced or unclear, we're going to want to call our best bluff catchers to this sizing, but only our best bluff catchers. This hand is a pretty impeccable bluff catcher. 
There's actually a reason why I really like a hand like this as a bluff catch, and it's to do with blockers and unblockers. This is theoretical, but you're not really blocking any bluffs with this hand, right? Because Villain isn't going to have the offsuit 7 of diamonds, nor is he going to have the offsuit 4 of diamonds. So Villain's bluffs here are going to be one large diamond, which you unblock, yet you do block two nut flushes with this combo. The Ace 4 of diamonds and the Ace 7 of diamonds, and Villain is kind of moving towards having the nut flush here, not just the random flush. So this yeah. is an extremely good bluff catcher. It's very positive. Probably an equilibrium to call. So let's, let's analyze these two competing thoughts that you seem to be mm -hmm. having. It can't both be under bluffed, yet Villain can have lots of combos of Ace of Diamonds X, right? That seems like a contradiction because he doesn't have that big a value rate here. He has, what, like Ace Deuce, Ace Three, Ace Eight, Ace Ten, Ace Queen, Ace King of Diamonds, and then maybe like King Queen of Diamonds, but I don't actually think people are going to shove with the non nut flush here very often at all. So it wouldn't take very many combos of Ace of Diamonds X for this to become a call. You do need 40% equity to call to X pot, which would mean that Villain would have to have sort of Ace of Diamonds King, Ace of Diamonds Queen. That would be enough if he was always doing it with those hands. So for it to be underbluffed, yeah. Villain or Pool here would have to be saying no thank you to those bluffs with those blocker hands, with Ace of Diamonds X hands, but doing this with the nut flush really often. And for this to be overbluffed, they would have to be like doing something else with the nut flush and very often bluffing with Ace of Diamonds X. It's kind of unclear to me what's going on here, but I would guess that in general, anyone who's capable of like pulling the trigger on this kind of bet size is going to be like relatively reggy and like kind of clued up. However, do you know what really scares me here, Mark? The flop sizing in conjunction with this, because like a really strong yeah. player that understands how to like bluff the flop, turn and river for all in, is usually going to know that like small is the normal sizing on this board. The times this is a fish, this will be very underbluffed. And what's kind of scaring me a bit here is that when this is a fish, it's <laughs> extremely likely to just be the nut flush very often. When this is a reg, it's probably going to be like unclear to me whether this is underbluffed or overbluffed. So, but, but also given the the overbet on the turn, you know, do we do we take that read as being this is more on the reg side than the fishy side, or not? Probably, yeah. I just I, I don't know what player this is. I suspect that player type is a spectrum, just like height is or something like that. Where you, you're not mm. just either tall or you're short. You could be like in between. And I think this could be like a semi-studied player that's kind of got some idea of what's going on, but not like a massive idea. So overall, yeah. I do think the spot is like theoretically a call. I don't think it's an enormous deviation to fold once you start saying, oh God, like this guy has got weird sizes. They're a bit all over the place. Are they going to find the bluffs? But I don't think I'm going to hate a call here. Like I think this is still relatively murky to me. I wouldn't be shocked if against the pool, the, the 20 NL pool that you're playing against, that this was actually a fold. Like I wouldn't be totally shocked, but I think it's quite close. Yeah, it, it, this is 50. Let me this give you one more, piece, Sorry. one more piece of information. Is the guy, I had about 500 hands on the guy, and he was right. a 29, 21, 10. Oh, okay. So, like, really reggae looking. I, I grew reggae looking. Yeah. I mean, reggae and aggressive. So. Yeah, call is fine. I mean, you're going to, a player like that will very often have, like, Ace of Diamonds X and, and stuff in this spot and be using blockers. I think, I think it's safe to, to just stick to the GTO plan against that kind of player. Against someone that looks really tight or looks kind of fishy, I would actually fold, but. In general, I think it's close because there will be like both of those player types will exist, right? So if you don't know who it is, it's probably close. Against like nifty looking people and recreationals, it's probably a fold. And against like aggro looking regulars, it's probably just like a call. But it wouldn't take much of a read here for me to want the fold. But I think you're giving yourself a bit of a hard time by, you know, yeah, condemning okay. this call. I think you're right to like assume that there's going to be some Ace of Diamonds X from this player type for sure, like a good amount. Yeah, I feel a, a bit. I feel better, I have to say, because I, I did feel, I feel like shit. I ran into it here, and I should have folded here. But I, I understand everything that you just said there. So, and it does make me feel a little bit better on it. I'm, I'm concerned though that it'll give me, uh, you know, the caller in me will have the confidence now to call again, <laughs> and well, I don't want. Well, you know, here's the thing, right? If that was a fish, I'm not sure I was. I, I'm able to fold that, and and maybe maybe I am, but maybe I'm being hard on myself. Um, yeah, I mean, you're allowed to make mistakes as well, right? That's the thing. But yeah. one thing I would say is that the thing to avoid here from coaching mm -hmm. is the following. Like, if I was to say my therapist said that I need to be more assertive, right? And I need to stand up. This isn't, like, what's happened, right? This is just a hypothetical. And I need to be really assertive and start standing up for myself in more situations in life. And then I go off and go to, like, 
Subway and I order a sandwich and they're like, I'm sorry, we don't have any onions today. And I'm like, no, that's not good enough. You should be ashamed of yourself. And I start launching into a tirade about the onions. That you could say that's a misapplication of what my therapist told me to do, right? I've, I've become more assertive, but in a spot that's kind of futile and like misguided and isn't really gonna help me. So if you go away from the session and go, I'm allowed to call in some random spot without doing analysis because in some other spot I was allowed to call, you're just doing what I'm doing in the subway. It's actually really silly, right? So avoid that at all costs. Sounds good. Engage with the specifics of the situation, please, 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 please. Right, that's important. It's important for this journey overall. Guys, IO vs. Population is an educational strategic e-magazine on No Limit Hold'em cash games that you can grab over at caracorner.com. It breaks down the theory behind some of the most common and important spots for your win rate, making solver outputs understandable and digestible so that you can see why the solver is playing the hands the way it chooses to do so. With Pio vs Population, you never have to feel lost like you're staring at a meaningless sea of hand charts because we'll break down the logic behind every strategy we recommend. But not only that, the most lucrative thing about Pio vs Population is that for every spot we cover, we show you how your opponents are likely to go wrong. This means you can craft a really effective exploitative strategy and punish them to devastating effect. You can learn how to master a key spot, not just theoretically, but exploitatively too, for just $9.99 an episode. Or why not pick up our mega bundle and save £50 in the process? You never need to feel lost again in those tricky common spots with Pio vs Population, e-magazine for No Limit Hold'em cash games, available only at caracorner.com. Now let's get back to the action. We're skipping fives because it was a tiny pot. We're focusing on the bigger pots. Ace King, squeezing button, cold call from small blind. Interesting. 10, 7, 3. I'm going to give you permission to do something that I wouldn't normally let you do here, and that's to play your hand in a vacuum against this player's range. The reason for that is it's such a wacko spot that I don't actually think there'll be a whole lot of benefit from saying, what would theory do in a cold call, squeeze pot, blah, blah, blah. I don't think there'll be much benefit from that. I think I'm betting small in this in this situation. You can just play your hand. You can literally just tell me what you want to do with your hand here. I don't mind. So why are you betting small? Any reason for that? Um, I think, well, obviously I have the king of clubs, so I don't mind building a pot that I can get it all in on the turn of the river if, if a club comes. So that's really the extent of my... Okay. Process, I think. So yeah, I don't think it really matters what we do here. I think, I think usually in a three bet or four bet pot, betting small and checking will be extremely similar in EV because the eventual ceiling of what you can get in is just going to be unchanged, right? You can easily get the money in. Either way, I don't mind checking here. I don't mind betting small here. I really don't care. You could bet 10th pot here. I really don't care what you do as long as you don't like bomb it and just filter villains range massively for no reason. I think you can do anything. So yeah, this is, this is fine. It's not stress it too much but i just wanted to hear if you had a preference i think it's mm -hmm. good to be indifferent sometimes it's liberating actually to be indifferent yeah. sometimes yeah. and accept yeah. where you are indifferent so feel free to say that bill and checks your analysis please on this node i think similar and i'm probably indifferent here if if i think about his range i'm probably i feel like i'm behind a lot of his range here because he has a lot of pocket pairs he's calling he has sets if he's you know if he didn't want to let go of sevens nines or tens he's got them and i think i would check back a lot here i mean i think we're beating a few hands maybe like ace queen with the ace of clubs if they're cold calling like that wide or something but not many so i guess one thing you could do here is you could say well what do i expect a recreational player to do against the bet here like if i bet here and let's say i bet third pot which would be like the kind of gto sizing in this spot do i expect like jacks what do i expect jacks to do what do i expect eights to do what do i expect mm. queens to do this sort of thing would expect sets to do. I think there'll be a lot of jamming, more yeah. than there should be, probably, and that actually puts me off betting. So when I'm in a spot with a recreational, and I think betting and checking are close, and I have a draw, but it's a low SPR, and I think jam will just trigger happily happen more often than it should, I'm actually going to shy away from betting. So I like check here. I agree. Nice. River the ace, villain bets one third pot. Your thought process, please. The SPR is low. I think I'm discounting a lot of flushes in his range here because I have the king blocker and I don't think there's many okay there's exactly ace queen maybe of clubs so I think he if he has ace queen I know what I did I, I shoved here because I thought at this SBR he's he's not going to fold ace queen and I know that's probably very a very narrow part of his range and so think, you were giving him hands like sets on the turn at some frequency yeah, have those I was, gone but... away? Have, have those have those disappeared, or are they still there? At some frequency, in your opinion? I think 
I think when he checks twice, I think they're not there. Well, the first check is procedural. Right, the first check was procedural. Yeah, the second check. I think sets are betting a lot before the river. So yeah, I'm but they're 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 checking. They're not always going to bet. They're not right? always a lot. I think. But well, well, actually, okay. So let's think about this. So he's check called the flop. So if he had sevens or tens, you're saying he would have raised instead most of the time. Is that the thought? Yeah. His check called the flop here, right? Yeah. This is I, his I only I, opportunity yeah. to aggress. Yeah. Is here, right? On the turn, he checks procedurally. He doesn't have the chance to aggress on the turn. Yeah. Right, because <clears throat> you check back. Remember. So I disagree that nines is raising here. I think nine. nines is calling. I, th I think tens and sevens are sometimes slow playing here as well, for yeah. whatever reason. So I think there's more sets than you're giving it credit for. Yeah. I think there are flushes too, like queen jack or ace x of clubs, ace queen of clubs, sometimes maybe ace jack of clubs, something like that, that can also slow play, sometimes. There are a lot more hands in his range here that beat you than you're accepting at the time of this hand. Ace queen is folding flop. Ace queen suited is probably folding flop a lot. What yeah. ace queen do you expect him to have here? Ace of clubs, I guess. Ace queen offsuit, but then he's called a squeeze, right? So like hand reading wise, this is a little all over the place. I know it can happen. It can but, happen. Like but you have to discount it. Ace queen with a club is a couple of combos, mm. and yeah. you have to discount them heavily. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Focusing yeah. in really heavily yeah. on a couple of very heavily discounted combos is going to get you into a ton of trouble. We need to restructure this thought process, right? And the way, here's how we're going to do it. We're going to start off by just trying to gauge our equity, right? So you mm. clearly thought that you had like some kind of value beater here, not a bluff catcher, and then you you decided you had enough equity to raise. Do you know how much equity against villain's range you would need to go all in here for value? What do you think? How much sort of equity, roughly? Think back to Carrot Poker School, grade one, try and use that. About 70%? This has to be Probably a bit more. Maybe like 75 or something, because you're repolarizing, remember, right? He's going to be polarized to some extent here. Not lots, but like some extent. So you're going to need like 80% equity. 75, 80% minimum. Do I have that? Probably not in this. Absolutely not. Absolutely not you are closer to being an underdog than you are to having 75 or 80 yeah. percent equity here i wouldn't be surprised if your equity here was 40 percent. i would be surprised if it was 70. i think it's likely somewhere around 50 if i had to guess because you're going to see some merges here like he's randomly <coughs> just betting like some pair or something sometimes because he's a random weaker player right that doesn't know what yeah. he's doing sure but you've way overestimated your equity in this hand and i think you've just tunneled in on ace queen you've literally done the tunnel vision pitfall and i'll tell you why because you played poker for two years before you did carrot poker school unfortunately our brains are stupid and they learn things and then they don't forget them even when we know they're wrong Think about that for a second. They they yeah. keep using things that we consciously remember. know are wrong. So even though you know not to tunnel in on one hand, mm. now consciously your subconscious is still doing that. So what do we do about that? How do we treat this going forward? What do you think? Well, probably a bit more conscious thinking through the hand and and focus. That that's maybe an issue for me sometimes. That mm -hmm. I'm not hand reading linearly through the hand as, as right. well. Good, I think. Good. I like that point. Yeah. What about the fact that you're kind of, you're hand reading in quite an abrupt, narrow way? So whenever you say something yeah. like ace queen is there, ace queen will call, that yeah. should set off alarm bells, right? You should be thinking, wait a minute, how yeah. can I specific, it's almost like the targeting pitfall. Why do yeah. I ban targeting from my discord? Is it because I'm a megalomaniac dictator that wants to stop people saying the words that all the other coaches say? Yes, absolutely. But yeah, it's also, there's that, yeah. that, but there's also that targeting is a trash term. Yeah. And the reason targeting is a trash term is that it can be okay if the thing you're targeting is a massive part of your opponent's range. But in that case, why even like target it? It just is your opponent's range. And when it's a small part of your opponent's range, what the hell are you doing? You know, targeting a small part of your opponent's range. What, you're going to like telekinesis control them into having that hand? Like you're not. So the problem is it's too narrow. So just like try to allow yourself to ring your own alarm bells when you hear yourself thinking something like that in future and try to interrupt yeah that thought process. It'll, it'll take a bit of undoing, you know, but it's possible to do it. But I think that's why we make this mistake. Yeah. I mean, yeah, villain's range is, I guess it's just villain's range was very different to your hand reading. You need to work on hand reading here. Yeah, and it's, it's a hard spot to read as well, but. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah, it's not, yeah. A, it's not a regular spot, so yeah. But the thing I would say is that you're, with respect, I don't want to come across really harsher, but you're way off there, right? Yeah, yeah. And when you're way off, you need to sort of sit down and be like, right, I need to look at that. It's not just a little bit. So that's the first hand that's a blunder today. The other ones have been okay, right? That's the that's a blunder.
I thought you were going to maybe even argue for folding river at one point like when you started talking there I was like I was actually unsure whether it was closer to a fold or closer to a race that's how much of a polarization error it is it's like nowhere near either right nowhere near either closer to a fold though if I had to guess but I wouldn't fold okay blind versus blind classic single race pot mm. check we float bet you're building big bet here are you betting this always are you mixing are you checking a lot here with this hand what do you think with this hand I'm I think I'm probably always betting we need to be revisiting optional, mandatory, and prohibited, right? The three types of value bet, the three types of bluff from lectures two and lectures three of grade one of the Carrot Poker School. Value bets like this are never mandatory because your hand is just not that good. You're not trying to put in a stack with this hand. So you don't have to bet now. This is optional. Mixing. Indifference. You need to be approaching this as, I don't mind whether I bet or not. Unless villain is a station, that's another thing. If villain's a station, you can bombs away through streets. Otherwise, no rush, right? Chill. Urgency is not high. Your hand is good. It's not great. You have to bet a set. You don't have to bet Queen 10. You can bet Queen 10. How do people butcher this spot as villain 72? How does villain yeah. 72 butcher this spot when he checks? Make it easy for them. I think I know what you mean, but could you elaborate just a bit for the audience? When I bet for a big size here, it just makes the decision really easy for them. They fold what they should fold and they call what they should call it. Just You make more hands indifferent when you bet small. I think on a board like this. Yeah, I mean, not in game theory. Like in game theory, what you're doing is okay. Like you can bet big or you can bet small here. It doesn't really matter. In practice, I agree that probably people play close. It depends what you have, though, right? I I'd like to I'd like to scrap this for a second. Just ask you a simple, much simpler question. Yeah. What's the difference between villains range on average in this pool for checking this flop and pile solvers range for checking this flop? It's weaker than standard so right. population under checks on the blind versus blind single they, race they under protect their checking range right what does that mean for our hand if they are if they have a really weak checking range here it's got too much air in it it's got too many terrible hands in it Things what does that, that mean for queen 10 goes up in equity sure but what does it mean for what we want to do with our hand we're ahead of a lot of the yeah we're, we're ahead of a lot of the range so if you knew your opponent had four deuce of spades what would Don't you do with this hand break. Don't need what, that big. what would you do with this hand if you could see he had four deuce of spades? You check it. Good. So actually, if they have air too often, the exploit is to slow play your hand, not fast play it. Makes sense, yeah. I mean, if they just have like a jack too often, maybe you bet three times or something. But I think the problem is that too much of their range is fives, ace high, sixes, king high. Just hands that you want to check against and pick off turn bets. If you made me deviate here, I'd actually like checking. I love checking back. And this is a pattern I'd like you to apply immediately in your game. When a recreational player or unknown in a, in a soft pool checks to you as the raiser on the flop, you should actually check back a ton of your top pair because they're going to be underprotected. Meanwhile, if you had 7-8 of diamonds, what does it mean for that hand? What about now? If you have 7-8 of diamonds, what should you do then? Bet. Bet, because now your fold equity has gone through the roof. So the way you play your own range exploitatively should be an imbalanced way that takes advantage of that pool read. But in theory, you do not have a pure bet here because there's no way your hand is like high enough equity to have to build the pot immediately. It can, sure, but this is a, a leak that so many people watching this will have where they routinely bet Queen 10. It's the wrong exploit against pool. It's actually going backwards. It's going north when you should be going south. Okay, we get raised. Thoughts? I felt indifferent calling here. That's yeah, a good thing to admit, like when to yourself, just like, I feel indifferent. It must be close. I think that's right. I think your equity is gone. Your EV is reduced significantly. I don't think you're indifferent though. Blind versus blind because ranges are so wide here. I think it's probably just a, a winning call and you should make it. But you're not far from being indifferent. You're moving towards being indifferent. But I like the call. Bill and Bet's turn. What do you think? So now they're obviously polarizing on a very wet board and I have a, I have top pair and I have a hybrid uh, draw to the, to a, not the nuts, I guess, but it's a, a strong enough draw. I call, I'm never raising, I don't think. Yeah, I don't, I don't want to have to like throw up on my keyboard. So please don't raise, don't raise, don't do it. So call seems like the normal play. I mean, it feels indifferent as well, though. It, it does it's feel very close. icky. Yeah. It's icky. Yeah. And it's, just, and you're meant to be quite unhappy. It's not a call you make because you're like, yes. Here and a straight draw. Here we go. It's more just like, oh God, I have a decent amount of equity. I need a decent amount of equity. I don't have much more than a decent amount of equity. I call. Yeah. Let's see what happens. If you don't have outs here, if you have like queen five, you just pitch, right? Because pool's probably under bluffing a node where they check raise and then barrel here. 
probably. I would think on this card they're under bluffing. The problem is that your hand is such a good call in theory that probably you still have to call even if they're under bluffing, but it's it's not nice for sure. They're under bluffing this node, I would agree with you. I think you're kind of implying that and I would agree. And I'm blocking bluffs as well, I'm thinking so. You're blocking value too. Don't don't focus on half of your blockers. Don't just pick and choose which ignore you should ignore blockers for now. And I'll tell you why. Because one, they only actually add up to a few percent swing in most spots. And secondly, if you're going to pick and choose, you're better off ignoring them if, you, if you're not ready to be holistic yet. It's just oh. healthier. Ignore blockers. Don't worry about it. In some spots, sure, where it's really obvious, right? I block the busted nut flush draw. I don't want to bluff forever. Okay, sure. But here, you don't have the right to talk about blockers. That sounds so patronizing and so mean. But you actually don't because it's not a big enough part of the puzzle. This is about your equity. It's about your EV and it's about your opponent's range. It's not about blockers, so let's not go there. Blockers are usually just kind of like one of these little factors that it's easy to grab onto, but actually they're not a big enough piece of the pie to matter. That's how I would explain it. Okay, so we call... Okay, so if we thought term was underbluffed, is it fair to say that River is also underbluffed? Yes. What is your hand class in the facing bets system of the carrot poker school? When you face it's Catcher. Bluff catcher. Define that again for the audience, please. Behind all value and ahead of all bluffs in villain's range. Good, and because it's the river, behind can mean 0% equity and ahead can mean 100% equity. If it was a turn, it may be murkier, yeah. If it's an underbluffed spot and we have a bluff catcher and it's significantly underbluffed, what do oh. we do? What oh. did you do? Oh. Why? Because I convinced myself that I blocked the straight, I think. Not allowed to think about blockers. On the turn, block, you're thinking we, about blocking know, bluffs. Yeah, we we yeah. haven't had this conversation. No, before. you're meant to be psychic. You're meant to know that we had this conversation already. Um, yeah, no, I, I know in my head it was, I block all the straights that would take this line, and I block queen. The, I have queen blocker. And right. I think this is a reasonable bluff catcher, was my thought process. But, but it's under bluffed. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it may be a reasonable bluff catcher. I don't know. It may not be. It strikes me as an okay bluff catcher. Mm. Definitely you block some bluffs too. But it doesn't strike me as like a bad bluff catcher. The mm. problem is that three straight after filtering like check raise bomb bomb is super under bluffed. It's not. And again, I think what we should do is we should start qualifying how under bluffed we think lines are. Like, are they just a bit under bluffed or are they like getting butchered by the pool that the pool is barely bluffing? And I think this is actually much closer to the latter. Yeah, I'll be clear in game, Pete, I didn't think, is this under bluffed line? And that, that's, exactly. the, that's the view I have. I need to inject that into my top. Exactly process. the problem. Yeah. Let me ask you something, though. And this isn't me like insinuating anything. I'm genuinely curious. Is it the case that in game, you wanted to call or felt a resistance to folding, like as a mental game thing? Like, did you feel some innate resistance to folding in game? Yeah, I think I think so. Yeah, I think. Is I that did. common for you? Like when you're having? Yeah. Is that common all the time, or just in particularly bad sessions? It's common, I think, all the time in big river spots. That this has been a, a leak in my game for two years. I think mm -hmm. it's. Uh, I think I, I identified it well over a year and a half, ago, mm -hmm. and so I haven't been able to get to the nub of why and what. And the closest, okay. sorry, I think the answer is is what you the answer you've given me the answer. I just have to inject that question in at this point and be strict with myself to just it's a, this is a bluff catcher i pitch this is easier said than done i it's agree with you that that's what you that's what you need to get to that's where you need to get to but i think that's stating a finish line i'm not mm. sure that's showing you how to run to the finish line let's wrap this up instead of doing another hand with really trying to fix this leak and then summarizing our session right because i have a few thoughts on the general session we've had today because i think this has been a tough one for you mark i'm gonna guess that this has been hard right to see these hands to get a little bit, I, I don't think I've been roasting you, but I've been fairly disciplinarian today because like I've been trying to sort things out a bit and I've been trying to give you a bit of shock factor today a little bit as well, right? And also it's YouTube, so let's shock everyone while we're at it. But this has been a tough session, right? A lot of these spots have been quite hard and I hope that you will take how disconcerting this session has maybe felt and like how uncomfortable it's maybe felt at times and channel that into like a determination. That's what I'm hoping will happen. That's the way I operate. So yeah, I think I will. I think this will give me the ammo to focus. I have, I have already had that sort of, you know, I'm motivated to fix it, but I haven't had the answer yet. I haven't had a road, a solution towards how I actually fix this. So I'm, I'm all ears and I'm, yeah. 
I really yeah, want so, to fix it. I'm really motivated to fix this. Good. So there's two points here, right? So the first one is just the general session we've had, the way I've been coaching you, the way like everyone will have watched, the way we've been interacting here. And the reason for the audience's benefit and for yours, Mark, that I've been like that today, that I've been kind of shocked you a little bit, like sort of ruffle your feathers a bit. You may have noticed that, right? I've not been quite as placid as I maybe was in the first session and that's because I know you respond well to that so if you were a different kind of student and you rocked up here and you were a wreck and you were going to break down if I was like harsh with you I would not do that right I try and build you up but what I'm trying to do is get results and I think the best way to get results is to shock you by saying you know this sort of call while this happens I want you to look at this for a second while that happens I know it's painful to watch you have no chance of turning that graph upside down and our series has no chance of being a success and everyone out there watching will not see the graph go the right way unless you run like God, like 1% of people that run like a deity and just do it anyway, right? But like that aside, you know, it's not gonna happen. So we do need to fix this. And that brings us full circle back to the first point, which is how do we go about untangling this leak? And I think it will come down to a fear or anxiety, right? So let me give you a bit of ammo to go away and think about, a bit of fodder here for your, for your mental game thoughts. If there's something that your brain is doing here, that we could say is running a program that makes you call. It's running a mental program that makes you make this call. And that mental program that makes you go, ah, oh, well, I have good blockers. I want to call, so I'm going to call. I want to be sticky, I'm going to be sticky. That's probably afraid of something. That part of your brain that's running that script is probably afraid of something. Maybe folding, maybe not calling for some reason. What do you think it's afraid of when you Getting call in blocked. these spots? Getting, Getting blocked. blocked. Is that like very scary to you? Like that idea, like to that part of your brain? And if so, why why is that leaving such a a mark? No pun intended. I don't think it's well, maybe scary is the wrong word, but it's definitely a it may it like a lot of these things are personality. So mm -hmm. like I just feel like they're not gonna get the better of me. Mm -hmm. uh, and I feel like the way to do that is to catch them mm -hmm. rather than the answer is actually to fold, right? The, <laughs> the, the, the better thing spot, to sure. I think in, in this spot but mm -hmm. but I'm not able to see that so I will like like going back I will for a while I stopped playing with a hood because I felt I was looking for the stat that yeah in, that that justified a call and yeah that, that was the problem for me with with, with playing with a hood yeah um, that I recognized that that's what I was doing I was using the hood I was finding a stat that said yeah I, I can call here my inclination was to call I don't know I think so that's very powerful, right? That is a very powerful mechanism. Maybe scary is the, the wrong word, but untenable. It's untenable to get bluffed, right? It's not acceptable to you. It's not okay. Mm. And as long as that part of your brain thinks that it's not okay to get bluffed or to be run over, bulldozed, whatever you want to say by these people, you will always have that strong compulsion towards calling. So actually, maybe counterintuitively, maybe this will be scary. The thing to work on is actually being okay with being bluffed and being yeah. beaten by someone who has a worse hand than you. So what I'd like you to do for homework is go away. I'd like you to visualize this player, Villain72. Give him a little, you know, an appearance. Give him a goatee and some glasses, you know. Imagine what he looks like. And imagine that you fold here and he rolls over a hand and he's like, yeah, I'm macho reg. Yeah, yeah, I bluffed you. You know, and you folded the best hand. And I want you to imagine that and I want you to keep imagining that. I want you to keep doing it in a really sort of sentient way where you're super aware of your internal state. And I want you to just watch yourself begin to accept it. First off, why should you accept that when that happens? Why would it be a good idea for us poker players to be chill with that eventuality of someone bluffing us, flexing, winning the hand with a worse hand than us? Why should we be okay with that? Because it's an innate part of the game. It's, yeah. it's, and it's also, in, in my pool, they under bluff. So it's not yeah. the main thing that's happening. It's, mm -hmm. it's an infrequent thing. So, you know, and I've, I've gone through my poker tracker. I've, I've filtered hands and I've, I've done tables showing what people show up with. So I, I have all the data in my, mm -hmm. you know, I, I've convinced myself at least on a, in an acad academic way mm -hmm. that this is what they're showing up with. And yep. yet I still can't fucking fall. So that's because the part of your brain that's making Incredible. this running the script is an emotional lizard brain yeah. back yeah. of the brain part, right? That's running yeah. the show here. And that part, is not fueled by rational logic and things that you have apprehended in your conscious mind. It's fueled by emotion yep. and it's fueled by innate ideas, like instinctive, primitive ideas. And the idea that you being bluffed is being bested by a rival, you know, tribe member here or whatever they may be, that is what's triggering you to call. So you have to be no longer afraid of being, you can be afraid of being bested by a tribe member but you need to disconnect that from being bluffed. Being bluffed does not equal being bested. 
And when you've unpacked that and you're no longer anxious or, you know, unacceptant of it, you're no longer defiant of that, mm. you will then feel at peace with folding. You will not fix this by going, I've looked at the data, I've seen that they're under bluffing. Yeah. I promise you, you won't. You will um, not fix it that way. So if, if we're going to get you winning, we coach your mental game as well. And I'll leave it on that note. Today's session was tough. You made a couple of big mistakes. I grilled you on it, but you're going to use it as ammo to improve, both technically and mentally. And we'll check back in for episode three. Any final thoughts? No, listen, I, I'm really thrilled that we've got, like so quickly, we've got to what I feel is the biggest issue that I have in the game. And I've felt it for a while. So, and, and I didn't say it to you. So kudos to you. You've literally picked up on it immediately. So it's, it's um, I'm, I'm excited to have a bit of a roadmap here. I'm going to go off and make a bit of a plan as to how to, I might, I might meditate pre, pre yeah. game and imagine, you know, imagine this happening and just be, you know, get it up feel the feelings of how exactly. it will feel and, and try that try to do that that's exactly that right only by feeling the feelings change will your your sort of rote response to this trigger change and my mental game book poker therapy is all about that change of your mental conditioning that's on carrot corner guys you can check that out i never plug my book i don't think i've plugged it in years so i've been plugging the carrot poker skill if you're gonna buy one though by the skill but anyway yeah we'll check back in with you in the next episode next week We'll see how we're doing with this and we'll see what other leaks we can unearth as we move from losing to cruising. Until next time, this has been Pete Clark with Mark. Mark the station. Not for long. Not for long. Thanks, Not for long. We're going to fix it. We'll see you next time. Yeah. Bye, guys. Thanks.